Good morning and welcome to the Center for a New American Security. I am Elisa Catalano Ewers, a senior adjunct fellow here at the Center. And this morning, I'm pleased to welcome all of you for our conversation on Lessons of the Syria Conflict, which is a paper being released by the Center, authored by one of our three panelists, Nick Danforth. And I am pleased to have with us Nick, as well as two other esteemed panelists for a conversation today. Uh, we will be having a bit of a chat and then opening it up for your questions. As I mentioned, Nick Danforth, a visiting scholar at the Elliott School at the George Washington University, the author of the book, The Remaking of Republic, Republican Turkey, Memory and Modernity Since the Fall of the Ottoman Empire, and of co course, the author of the report we are discussing today. Nick, welcome. Thank joining, you. Joining him, Mona Yakubian, the senior advisor for the Middle East and North Africa at the US Institute for Peace. She served recently as the executive director of the congressionally appointed Syria study group. She also served as a deputy assistant administrator in the Middle East Bureau of USAID from 2014 to 2017. Uh, in addition to at least a decade at the US State Department and numerous other uh, positions in the think tank community in Washington. Mona, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. And finally, Ambassador Robert Ford, who is joining us from Chile, Chile Maine, uh, a 30 plus year veteran of the Foreign Service and the Peace Corps, having of course, as you all know well, finished his career as the US ambassador to Syria from 2011 to 2014. And I think always needs to be mentioned was also our US ambassador to Algeria before his time in Damascus. Ambassador Ford, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure to be with you this morning, thanks. So we're here to talk about a paper that Nick has authored called Lessons from the Syria Conflict. And I think it's particularly interesting for us to be having this conversation, not only about Syria, uh, which 11 years on, the conflict in, in a bit of a kind of a frozen state, but nonetheless still in conflict, um, but also in the context of what's happening in the region more broadly, uh, what we have experienced in terms of the U.S. role in the Middle East and beyond with the backdrop of the U.S. withdrawal in Afghanistan, with the upcoming change in the military mission in Iraq at the end of this month, and of course, continuing conflicts in the region, in Yemen and elsewhere, and, and conflicts all around um, as we look beyond the Middle East as well. And so I think this discussion is first and foremost about Syria and what we can objectively learn from the last decade plus, uh, about U.S. policy successes, failures, and where we go from here. But also it's a chance for us to really talk about U.S. policy toward conflict moving forward and, and lessons to be learned about, about the policy of intervention or non-intervention in the Middle East and beyond. So I want to get into it so we have plenty of time for, for Q&A from the audience later. So Nick, I want to start with you. The, the paper, as you laid it out, uh, which is available, of course, on the CNIS website, uh, really tries to frame some lessons learned from U.S. policy towards Syria. And I think you know, the debate over what the U.S. should or should not have done continues to this day. Uh, you talk about one in particular that I, I'd like you to spend a minute on, which is you know, the, the tension between the U.S. need to do something uh, in, in every conflict situation, in every foreign policy challenge, um, but also other lessons. So I want to give you a couple of minutes to walk through the lessons as you identify them, uh, and specifically as they, as they pertain to Syria. Thank you. So yeah, first off, I want to thank the entire CNS team for their support in making both this paper and this panel possible. Uh, I also want to express my gratitude to all of the panelists, and not just for coming here this morning, but for commenting so thoughtfully on earlier drafts of this paper. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to continue the conversation in person. Uh, and finally, I want to thank Elon Goldenberg, who can't be here, uh, for shepherding this paper through to completion and for offering his insights 
uh, throughout the process as well. So as you said, the goal of this report was to look back at the last decade of often contentious, understandably passionate debate over Syria policy, uh, not to rehash or relitigate it, but to try to extract some broader lessons that could be useful uh, for everyone in Washington in confronting uh, or in debating similar crises in the future. Uh, because I think the one thing everyone agrees on is that at the end of the day, US policy failed in the face of the challenge it confronted. Uh, and to maybe go one step further in a debate that was framed in terms of intervention versus non-intervention, US policy often seemed to tread a middle ground that people on both sides of the debate agreed was less than ideal. So I'll try to summarize the four broad lessons presented in the paper and then say a little bit about what specific course of action they suggest for the US in Syria today. Uh, the first of these lessons is that it's both crucial and difficult to take into account the agency of foreign actors. Uh, the time and time again, the cleanest cases for and against intervention uh, relied on remarkably optimistic assumptions about how other countries would have behaved. Uh, for example, specifically after Russia's 2015 intervention into the conflict, uh, some in Washington have insisted that more support for the opposition earlier in the war I could have preempted Russian escalation. The paper, by contrast, makes the case that many of the forms of intervention under discussion in the 2011 to 2015 period uh, would have simply provoked this Russian escalation sooner. Uh, on the other side of the debate, though, there's an argument that seems to be gaining traction, whereby without US support, the rebellion simply would have died away. Uh, that without US rhetorical encouragement, without Obama's Assad must go statement, uh, without subsequent military support for the opposition. Uh, I mean, in short, without the forms of intervention that the United States did undertake, uh, somehow this catastrophe could have been curtailed. Uh, and I'd argue when you look at the role that other countries played in backing the opposition from the outset, um, you know, or specifically the role that Turkey subsequently played in backing certain opposition groups over the explicit uh, objections of Washington, uh, this optimism seems unfounded, uh, which is to say both of these assumptions uh, and others fail to account for the way foreign actors were likely to use their agency. Uh, and as a result, none of these strategies were likely to work as well as advocates imagined. The second lesson presented here involves the dangers of positive thinking. Uh, the most striking example of this, and one that's become even clearer with a host of memoirs written by Obama administration officials, uh, comes from the outset of the conflict. Uh, in that rather than confront the mismatch between what America wanted, which was Assad gone, and what America was willing to do to make this happen, uh, which was not much, uh, many policymakers were initially too quick to assume that the Syrian president was likely to fall anyways. Uh, and the point that this is not to say that this was a foolish assumption or that it was an obviously false assumption, uh, but simply that we all should have been quicker to question it precisely because it offered such a convenient path forward. The third lesson is that caveats don't count. Uh, Washington repeatedly sought to reconcile modest means with ambitious goals uh, by publicly articulating limited objectives, uh, but it got no credit for it. Uh, it's easy to forget that in August 2011, when Obama said that Assad must step aside, he also said in the next breath, the United States cannot and will not impose this transition upon Syria. Uh, it's up to the Syrian people to choose their own leaders, and we have heard their strong desire that there not be foreign intervention in their movement. Uh, and yet this caveat did little to dampen expectations in Washington or abroad that the United States would intervene. Now, one lesson, going back to the previous point, is that people should have avoided their own positive thinking in interpreting the president's word. Um, but the other lesson is that leader, leaders should realize that people are going to misinterpret their words uh, and speak accordingly. I think you saw this again in the U.S. relationship with the Syrian Kurds. Uh, U.S. officials repeatedly described that relationship, uh, the relationship with the YPG, as temporary, tactical, and transactional. Uh, but this did little to dampen the outrage in October 2019 when President Trump revealed just how true this characterization was. Uh, and in retrospect, it sometimes seems as if the purpose of this rhetoric uh, was as much to convince policymakers themselves that they could somehow escape the contradictions uh, that their own policies were created. And finally, 
The fourth lesson involves what Alyssa mentioned at the outset, which is the idea that in the face of a crisis, the United States always needs to do something. Uh, and this is certainly an assumption that's come in for a fair amount of criticism, uh, but also one that continues to frame many policymaking discussions. Uh, and what I think is specifically worth highlighting here is the way that this assumption gets invoked in policy debates, which is to say that in the Syrian case, a lot of people specifically played on this impulse uh, in order to push the United States to act. They specifically made the case that a failure to act would undermine US leadership uh, or undermine US prestige. And this can be an effective strategy. Uh, the paper talks about how it played out in the 90s in Yugoslavia uh, and how increasingly uh, the repu how increasing the reputational cost for the United States in Bosnia uh, actually helped push the eventual uh, intervention there. But it's also a high stakes strategy and one that can backfire. And I'd argue that one of the reasons US policy towards the Syrian civil war was ultimately uh, was damaging to US prestige is that you had so many people in Washington consistently repeating that it was. So what does this mean for US policy toward the conflict in Syria today? First, the paper looks at what, if anything, the United States can do to help preserve the regions uh, of Northwest and Northeast Syria that remain outside of the regime's control. Uh, and in both cases, of course, these regions retain their autonomy because of the presence of foreign troops, uh, Turkish in the Northwest, US in the, North in the Northeast. Uh, but there's a risk, I'd argue, to assuming that this military leverage will enable the status quo to go on indefinitely, uh, which means that to the extent possible, Washington should support negotiations that capitalize on this leverage to preserve as much autonomy as possible for this region. Um, I, this is in some sense already the strategy that Turkey is pursuing in Idlib, uh, and it's the strategy that the Syrian Kurdish leadership are pursuing in Rojava. Um, and specifically, this is a strategy in which Russia is already heavily involved. Um, and Idlib, you know, at the end of the day, this issue will be solved between Turkey uh, and Russia. And we can talk more about what the U.S. can do to play a positive role in this. I think it's minimal. Uh, but it, to the extent the U.S. can, uh, recognizing that Turkey and Russia will be the ultimate um, factors there, it can be positive. Uh, more specifically in the Northeast, I'd argue that unless Washington is really prepared to promise uh, and to defend a permanent military presence there, the best the United States can do is to support the SDF leadership uh, in their negotiations with the regime. And the second broad point is about sanctions. Uh, this, I think, is where there's the clearest mismatch between means and ends in US policy now. Uh, as it stands, US sanctions serve to punish Assad for his crimes and to push back against the perception that the regime has won. Uh, but they don't necessarily prevent these crimes or reverse the regime's victories. Uh, and there's a risk that they uh, will ossify into a status quo that fulfills our perceived need to do something, uh, but doesn't actually help. Instead, this paper argues that the administration should be willing to link sanctions relief to achievable goals. Uh, that is bargain changes in sanction policy for concrete concessions from the regime. And there are people who can speak with much greater expertise than me on the specifics of this. Uh, but it could include you know, greater cross-border humanitarian access in opposition regions, more equitable and effective distribution of humanitarian aid in regime-held regions, uh, and to the extent possible, sanctions should be used as leverage in trying to push for the best possible outcome uh, in the opposition-held parts of northern Syria that we've been discussing. So with this, I'll wrap up my overview of the paper, uh, and I'm eager to hear from the rest of the panel. Thanks, Nick. I think you've given both Mona and Robert and as well as our, our viewers a lot to respond to. I want to pull this thread a little bit on the fact that other actors get a vote uh, and, and uh, ask Mona kind of a, a two-part question. Um, one is, do you think we got anything right with respect to our assessment of the interests and the willingness of outside actors in Syria? Uh, and then you, how do you assess where they are now? So a little bit uh, reflective in the first part of the question, but also in, you, in of your assessment of, of how that's changed and, and what that means for, for Syria part, policy now with respect to these other outside actors. Thanks, Alyssa. And, and Nick, congratulations on your paper. It's excellent. And I commend it to all to read. It offers a really useful 
I think, very helpful reflection on the past 10 years and some good thinking about, you know, how we should be thinking about Syria going forward. Um, you know, Alyssa, I'm going to be honest. I, for me, it's hard to see. We did, I guess, on some level, assess intentions correctly. But to be honest, I think what's more glaring is the ways in which we vastly underestimated the agency of actors. And in fact, in, in writing that I've done, I've really talked about this, what I call a foundational analytic um, uh, uh, liability of, of not understanding well um, Assad himself, uh, as well as his allies. Um, in the case of Assad, I think, you know, I don't think we understood correctly the extent to which this was existential for him that this was a win or die uh, uh, kind of conflict, and that he would stop at nothing to maintain his hold on power. We saw it with the brutality of how he's prosecuted this war, barrel bombings, the use of chemical weapons on civilians. Uh, but I don't think initially we understood that. We understood just that as an Alawite minority how, how much this was an existential threat to him. And this was not in the same pattern as the previous Arab Spring uprisings in Tunisia and in Egypt. Um, I also think we did, not under, we did not understand well the role that Iran and Hezbollah would play. Uh, they too, I think, view this conflict in existential terms. And when Assad was faced with pressure, rather than backing down or capitulating, we saw them double down. Um, and this led to this escalatory uh, kind of dynamic that, uh, that characterized the Syrian conflict for many, many years. We also, I think, didn't understand fully where Russia was on this. And that I think Russia was very much informed by what happened in Libya, uh, where they felt burned. Um, and where also I think they were bound and determined not to see any more regime change in the region for purposes of the region, but also for their own purposes. And so there too, I think we underestimated the extent to which Russia would engage if it found the opportunity, which of course it did. Um, finally, I think we also didn't estimate our allies quite well uh, on issues around arming and the notion that we could manage militarization, that we could construct these um, joint operation rooms and somehow make a very clean, manageable process out of arming, and it was anything but. It was utterly chaotic. And we saw our allies, whether it was Turkey, Qatar, other Gulf countries, pursue their, um, their aims, their goals, as they saw fit. And I don't think we were able to, uh, to put in place the kind of control that we envisioned we could. So I think we, we just dramatically uh, underestimated the agency of other actors. And I think we need to pay close attention because I think we're going to see it going forward, but interestingly, in the opposite direction. Now we're seeing the region make different, cal different calculations about Assad. Now we're seeing a tendency toward normalization. And we're seeing it uh, with the UAE, with Jordan, with others. And there again, I think we should be, we should pay close attention and understand what the calculus is of each of these regional allies that we have if we seek to understand better where things might be going. I'm going to want to come back to you on this question of the changing perspectives, at least of neighboring states and what that means for options going forward. But but I want to go to Robert next, because you know, as, as Mona just pointed out, Robert, there was um, arguably a kind of an analytical failing here with respect to outside actors. I think one of the other premises of Nick's paper is that process broke down as well in terms of the policymaking, decision-making process in Washington with respect to Syria. And uh, you know that there was a bit of a, a, a princess in the pea syndrome happening and trying to choose in the middle road and not really understanding how that was going to meet the ultimate policy objective. Uh, I'd like to, to hear you talk about whether you agree or disagree with that assessment and, and, and how you've processed learning this lesson, if you agree, uh, with respect, again, to, to the questions Mona's raising on where Syria policy goes next. <clears throat> Um, well, thank you, Alyssa, and thank you for the invitation to uh, join the conversation this morning. And 
And I strongly agree with uh, what Mona just said first with respect to her praise for Nick's paper. And I'd like to add, I think it's, I think the lessons that Nick drew out in his paper are worthy of being read by everybody who's interested in American foreign policy right now. So, um, and then second, I think Mona got it just right with our failure to judge other actors' intentions. I have to be very frank. I do not recall a single instance when I was working on Syria policy between January 2011 and uh, when I left in February 2014, I do not recall a single instance where we discussed the implications were Iran to intervene militarily in a big way, and Hezbollah did in the spring of 2013 in the battle at El Qusayr, uh, which was not something that we had anticipated. Um, big analytical failure on my part and the part of others. Um, nor did we ever discuss what would be the implications were the Russians to intervene directly militarily. I think, in fact, there was an assumption um, that they probably would not do so. Um, and Nick's point about examining ex assumptions is spot on. So um, let me let me just add a couple of points about the princess and the pea, as you called it, uh, Alyssa. Um, first, it's important for people to remember looking back. And I only worked on the first part of the Syrian civil war from 2011 to early 2014. But I can't overestimate, I can't overstate, sorry, I can't overstate to people how important the Iraq experience, uh, the Iraq war experience was in the Obama administration's thinking, and also to an extent, the Libya intervention experience. Um, there was just nobody, I want to emphasize this, there was just nobody arguing for American military intervention, direct American military intervention in Syria in, say, 2012 and 2013. Everyone agreed that would be a bad idea. I distinctly remember a discussion uh, among senior uh, officials in the administration about a no-fly zone, and it very quickly uh, ended because the Pentagon said it would require, literally, I'm not making this up, thousands of military airplane sorties um, and involve hundreds of aircraft. And it was just, and for an indefinite period, and, and nobody wanted to go there, nobody. So um, we had a policy and an objective, I'm sorry, it was an objective to get to a negotiated solution. Nobody wanted regime change per se. It would, nobody wanted Baghdad 2003 all over again. What we wanted was more like Baghdad 2006 or even Baghdad 2010, where bitter opponents in a civil war in Iraq somehow did manage after exceptionally painful negotiations uh, to come to an agreement on a national unity government in Iraq in 2006 and in 2010. And as dysfunctional as Iraq was back then, it looked like it would be pretty good compared to Syria in 2006 or 2010. So that was the objective. It was never regime change. It was to get to that negotiation for some kind of a, I believe the language in the Geneva One communique that Hillary Clinton signed with Sergei Lavrov was a transitional uh, transitional government with full executive authority reached by mutual consent. That was the policy goal. Um, so if you want to call that intermediate, I, I would accept that uh, because the alternative seemed to be chaos in Damascus where you would have no clear government, um, sort of Baghdad 2003. Um, I don't know. Um, it seems that on some level, the American intervention gave us the worst of all worlds because it did, it did prolong the conflict. I, Nick's point that there would have been a conflict no matter what, I think is exactly right. But I think the quality of the American anti-tank missiles um, certainly put a dent in the Bashar al-Assad government's military capabilities on the ground. Um, therefore, we do have a responsibility for the prolongation of the conflict, even if the conflict would have happened no matter what. And I think, I think we have to understand that. We have to accept the responsibility for that. But, but, but I hasten to add that 
it was not like there wouldn't have been an uprising and there wouldn't have been foreign state intervention on both sides. Um, and so as we go forward in Syria, I think we need to really think hard, really think hard about uh, the reactions in Ankara and Moscow to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, Nick mentioned uh, trying to preserve autonomy, some level of autonomy in northwestern Syria and also in northeastern Syria. There are going to be a lot of other players in that. And the American role, as Nick said, is going to be circumscribed in, in many ways. I don't hear that discussed enough in the current Syria debate. And I think we really need to focus on that. Um, and then second, um, Nick's point about avoiding positive thinking. Oh my God, my whole career in the State Department, I have seen us fall victim um, to positive thinking. Sometimes we actually put out a rhetorical point or two for uh, uh, public uh, consumption. And we repeat it so often that we come to believe it ourselves. We start to believe our own propaganda. I have literally seen that happen. And, and I think we have fell victim to that to an extent in Syria. And we need to be aware of that kind of positive thinking about our capabilities and our leverage uh, going forward in Syria. I'm going to stop there, Alyssa. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take this moment to remind our, our viewers and participants online to, to please put your questions in the chat for our panelists that we will get to uh, after another round of discussion amongst us. Uh, so please, please take advantage of this opportunity to, to pose your questions for our panelists. Uh, and I, I want to come back, Robert, to this question of not only what we should be thinking about um, with respect to Syria moving forward, but also your thoughts on, on what we should be doing in addition to that thinking uh, moving forward. But Nick, I want to give you uh, the opportunity to play national security advisor for the day. Uh, your paper you know, does try to draw these lessons, broadly speaking, about how to think about conflict and to picking up this debate that's that's very healthy uh, in our in our discourse about intervention or non-intervention. So you, you you are you are in the position to apply those lessons. What what would you consider uh, to be the lessons that need to be applied? Uh, either in you know, take take other conflicts in the region or beyond as your starting point, or even just broadly from a strategic standpoint. But you, know, how how do you think we go about thinking about U.S. policy more broadly toward conflict uh, as you start to introduce in your paper? So let me try to give a roundabout and hopefully uh, useful non-answer to that question. Uh, something. Something that I wish we talked more about in the paper is specifically, what well, is what specifically about the Syrian conflict made it so difficult for Washington to uh, figure out how to approach it, and what that says about what kinds of conflicts the lessons are pertinent for today. Uh, because I think one of the things that did from the outset muddle or challenge a lot of thinking was specifically the ambiguity or the ambivalence about what interests were at stake in Syria. Uh, and that it was a country in which the United States didn't feel like it had a lot of um, interest per se, but in a region where the United States clearly did have uh, strong, long-standing interests. Uh, and in part because of this, I think the Syria debate got sucked into a broader uh, and very unhelpfully sucked into a broader argument about what, you know, what the scope of U.S. global commitments were, what the kind of American sphere of interests were in a rapidly changing world, uh, and that that broader debate made it harder for people to think concretely about Syria. And so when you think about some of the other uh, countries where the United States is really struggling to decide, you know, what role the U.S. military should play right now, I mean, they're not necessarily analogous. And I think it's useful to think about why they're not, um, you know, and that you have uh, debates over Ukraine and over Taiwan where you know it's their thorny issues, it's by no means clear what the United States should do, but the stakes are obvious. No one questions that United States interests are at play. Uh, and connected with this, when uh, you know when you're right on the border of Russia and China, when the Russian army, when the Chinese army are part of the story, no one's 
no one's forgetting about foreign agency. We may not know how to deal with it. We may not know, you know, what, how to think about it, but escalation is certainly part of the conversation. Uh, so in a way, I don't, you know, that's a different debate. And the other side, you have you know, horrific conflicts going on in Ethiopia, um, in Sudan. You can include Yemen in this. Uh, where, quite frankly, no one's debating intervention because everyone tacitly accepts that United States interests don't justify it. Uh, and so in a way, those conflicts, however bad they're, uh, they may be, aren't part of this, uh, aren't part of the same debate. And it's, you know, what's striking is that Syria, you know, from the outset was represented a difficult middle ground for people between these two kinds of cases. Uh, and I think that's clear, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric that's come out subsequently about how America's failure to intervene in Syria undermined U.S. credibility or undermined the liberal international order. Uh, you know, I think these are overblown claims, but it's worth thinking a little more about them because you can find examples. I talk about the former Yugoslavia case in the paper where, you know, in the early 90s, the idea of having a... Um, violent destabilizing genocidal conflict in Europe uh, did eventually, you know, it challenged policymakers' understanding of what the post-Cold War world they wanted uh, would be and ultimately led the United States to intervene in a way uh, that I'd argue created a lot of the assumptions about American credibility and um, uh, the liberal order itself that we're still wrestling with today. Uh, and on the other hand, again, you had plenty of conflicts during this, you know, the last uh, 30 years, you know, taking place, again, multiple conflicts in Sudan, a uh, ugly multifaceted civil war in Congo, uh, that no one ever claimed undermined U.S. credibility or no one ever claimed to challenge the liberal international order because we didn't care and they were outside the scope of where we thought that order applied. Uh, and there's a... Uh, there's a good quote from Obama. I wish I could remember where um, where I saw. It. I mean, he essentially addresses this point and says, you know, with some obvious frustration, why are people so upset at me about not doing anything uh, in Syria when no one, you know, no one's expected me to do anything in the Congo? Um, and so, to get back to the initial question, what I'd simply say is that as a number of debates going forward, I think in our foreign policy, are going to focus on what the extent of U.S. commitments are, what the extent of uh, U.S., you know, what the U.S. interests in the world are, the ones where these lessons apply and the ones where policymakers, wherever they fall on the intervention debate, should be most careful are the ones that seem to exist at this cost, to exist at the limits of what we see as our traditional interests. Uh, in the ones that get caught up in broader debates about US, the US role in the world. As far as non-answers go, that I think that was a, a pretty solid one. Um, I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna give Mona a chance to talk about you know, this question of, uh, as you just put it, Nick, kind of how, how the, the US engages and intervenes or otherwise uh, a looks at, at its interests in the rest of the world. And Mona, I want you to spend a minute, if you if you wouldn't mind, talking about you know, the human aspect of this, right? Um, you've spent decades and decades studying conflict in this part of the world, and, and ultimately, this conflict affects real human beings. And and you've spent quite a bit of your time in government service looking at questions of human development, um, humanitarian assistance, et cetera. How how does supporting those in conflict? kind of play into the conversation that we're having today, both in the context of Syria, where mm -hmm. the humanitarian crisis is still quite acute, um, but also as we look at other conflicts that Nick just mentioned, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, other places in the world where the humanitarian costs are also quite high. Um, so if you it would kind of bring us back to the human aspect in all of this in, in, in your answer. Thanks so much, Alyssa. It's such an important question, and I think something that often gets lost, honestly, um, in these discussions and debates, which is the lives of real people on the ground in conflict zones. And I want to answer it, if I could, in two different ways. One is kind of a broad observation about the nature of conflict in the 21st century. And what we're seeing is that conflicts are increasingly protracted. I think the average now duration of conflict is 30 years. Um, uh, according to IISS in its recent survey. Um, and while 
conflicts are increasingly intrastate. Um, they are characterized by a lot of external intervention. And there's nothing, uh, Syria is emblematic, I think, of this kind of 21st century complex conflict, which is often nonlinear. The notion of phased conflict as, uh, as our Department of Defense typically sees it, phases one, two, three, four, I think, I think that's no longer applicable. I think conflict is, is nonlinear, it's recurring. And what that means on the ground turning to Syria is that we have to think of new and different ways um, as we intervene on the humanitarian side, on the development side, on the stabilization side. Because we're faced right now in Syria with what I've been calling a very cruel paradox, where the conflict itself is largely frozen. We no longer see the large scale offensives that, we, that had characterized the conflict previously. And yet humanitarian suffering is at an all time high. It is the worst it's ever been. And so this begs the question of what can we do? How should we be engaging? We also see incredible amounts of trauma in Syria and in other conflicts because of this transgression of international norms. Again, Syria conflict characterizes it. We see unprecedented levels of trauma, uh, particularly amongst women and children. So I think we need to be rethinking how we um, intervene, for example, with regard to stabilization. Stabilization efforts, and this is what the focus of our work is in Northeast Syria. Um, it's not happening at the end of conflict. It's happening at a moment where we have control over a particular swath of territory and there's no um, uh, long-term settlement in sight. And so we're attempting stabilization activities in essentially a conflict zone. And so I think we need to be thinking much more creatively about what stabilization means. It shouldn't just be about rubble removal and getting lights back on. We have to think a lot about governance, about rebuilding social cohesion, about addressing trauma. Um, I also think we need to have trauma-informed interventions from the humanitarian assistance stage, you know, immediate life-saving assistance should be trauma-informed in its delivery, all the way to elements of, of early recovery. And finally on Syria, and I think conflict broadly speaking, is the issue of displacement and protracted displacement, which has also characterized this conflict and we're seeing it, of course, elsewhere across the world. Here too, we have to develop far more creative um, interventions when we are faced with a situation of protracted displacement, whether it's refugees living outside of their countries and in host communities. Lebanon, I think, is probably one of the most challenging examples of that, or people who are displaced internally. And, and we see that Syria, I think, has the largest number of IDPs in the world. And that has all kinds of implications going forward. One last comment I want to make, uh, I think it's really important with Syria to bear in mind we are seeing, a, I think, a very dangerous trend in some even European countries towards sending Syrian refugees back to Syria as the conflict has sort of, as I said earlier, abated. It's not over and it's still very, very dangerous for Syrian refugees to return. And yet we've seen Denmark, uh, among others, looking at this question. I think that needs to become a, 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 an issue front and center, that forced returns are against international law and should not be tolerated. I could talk about a lot of other things, but I wanna stop here and, and let others uh, jump in. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mona. And I think we'll, we'll have a chance to, for you to, to add to that as we take questions from, from the audience. So please, please share your questions for our panelists. Robert, I'm gonna combine one of my questions with one that's come in from the audience um, for you to kind of start us off on q and I had, I had kind of warned you, previewed that I wanted um, our, our audience to hear your outlook for what maybe should come next on Syria policy. But we also got a question uh, about what your views might be on what Syria policy should have been, not what the, the necessarily the criticisms of what the policy was, but what maybe should have been considered instead. So if you if you want to take that part of the question first and then and then lead us into maybe your outlook moving forward uh, and kind of kick off our Q&A with the audience that way. With respect to what the policy should have been, I think the most important point to remember going into an answer is that the United States by itself was never going to determine the outcome of the Syria crisis. They're just 
too many other players, too many other actors, states and non-state, uh, with agency. Precisely the point in Nick's paper. That said, I think we had one of two options that we should have looked at really much more clearly. Um, one would be the um, express general support for uh, Syrian uh, people's uh, rights under the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, for example, freedom of speech, freedom of peaceful assembly, uh, things like that, but it, leaving it at a, at a, at a verbal level um, and not intervening with material support to the Syrian uh, opposition. That would be sort of one end. I don't see how we could have said nothing about uh, the regime's repression, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean, as Nick said, that the United States always must do something. I, and so that would have been one option. I have to say, um, in a sense, that's where the president was in 2011, 2012, uh, really into early 2013. So um, the other option would have been um, sort of our policy plus uh, the problem of other uh, states and non-state groups having agency as it was a, a herding cats uh, from the Washington perspective was incredibly difficult. So we're sending arms to um, select groups um, who would go along with a negotiated settlement. That was our definition of moderate. If you would negotiate uh, with the Assad uh, government to get to that transitional national unity government that I mentioned, uh, we considered you moderate. But Turkey, Qatar in particular, were arming other groups who really were not there. And in particular, Nusra, uh, the Nusra Front at the time, um, the only way I think we could have ever stopped that, and I, even then I'm not sure we could have, would have been to have the president himself calling regularly to people like uh, Erdogan in Turkey and to the emir of Qatar and leaning exceptionally heavily on them, probably even threatening to withdraw our support entirely. Um, uh, we were not going to get that level of presidential involvement. Um, the president had a whole set of domestic and foreign policy problems in Syria was just one of them and not one where he was going to be willing to spend half an hour every other day um, haranguing people to sort of stay in line. Um, and short of that, I actually don't think the herding cats problem could have been resolved. I don't think the CIA director by himself could have done it. Um, I know John Kerry tried and got nowhere. Um, it, it really would require the president himself, and even then it might not be achievable. So then you're sort of stuck with no good options. <laughs> we, we, I mean, we understood it at the time. We had no good options. We were just trying to figure out the least bad option. I'm not sure we succeeded, to be frank. In fact, I have doubts that we succeeded. Um, it's, it's an awareness of that limited leverage that has made me come to think that there is not a whole lot that the Americans can do now in 2021 to achieve the objectives that, that Nick very reasonably laid out in his paper about saving some kind of autonomy in Northwestern and Northeastern Syria. And just to give you an example of how the agency plays into this. So I, I think it is uh, the administration's efforts right now are directed towards trying to get to a deal between the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Autonomous Administration in Northeastern Syria, and the Syrian government, which the Russians are also working at. But it, it appears to me that um, as long as the American government says, you know, we have the Syrian Democratic Forces back, we're not pulling out precipitously. Um, and in fact, the Biden administration seems to be saying we're staying indefinitely. That makes it even less likely that the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Autonomous Administration, this let's call it what it is, this uh, Syrian uh, YPG, PYD leadership, um, it makes it less likely that they're going to make compromises uh, that would get them to a deal with the Assad government. And the Assad government is not inclined to make, make compromises anyway. Let's be honest about that. Uh, but getting to that deal, I think, is even harder with the way we're handling the question of how long we're going to stay.
So uh, it's this is why I think in the end, if we're not prepared to stay indefinitely, and I have real doubts about that, um, that vote on uh, Jamal Bowman's amendment and the fact that most Democrats voted in favor of reviewing the authorization uh, for that forced deployment in Syria suggests to me that it's ultimately in the long term, uh, it's, it's the sustainability has to be questioned. And if there's a, any kind of serious casualty incident, that goes up even higher. Don't think the Iranians and Assad and the Russians and even uh, the Turks don't understand that. They absolutely do. They're not stupid. You've, uh, you've anticipated uh, Bassan's question uh, a bit. And so I want, I want to frame that for the audience, but also give Nick and Mona a chance to, to answer Bassan's question, but also this bigger question as you laid out of what are, what are the least worst options moving forward? Um, but Bassam's question is, is, is really about you know, the fate of the Arab majority in the northeastern region and this question of, of negotiations between the Assad regime uh, and the Kurds and, and what, if anything, could come from that. So, Nick, do you want to start addressing that and adding in um, uh, other thoughts as well? And Mona, I welcome you to, to do so, too. Certainly. And I'll actually I'll read the exact text of his question, which I think makes a, the point very clearly. The Assad regime and the Ba'ath Party have oppressed the Kurds since 1960. How is it possible the same regime gives the Kurds rights now? Uh, and I think a very fair question for all the reasons that Robert laid out. Uh, and one that obviously the YPG or the SDF leadership is acutely aware of. Uh, you know, we've seen in their efforts to negotiate with the regime, you know, with Russian um, support, you know, they recently put forward a set of talking points, you know, again, for a relatively modest form of autonomy, uh, ceding all, you know, foreign policy making control, uh, recognizing the power of the government, ceding uh, resources in the area to the authority of the central government, uh, even accepting the nominal you know, integration of their own units within the Syrian army, uh, you know, but again, holding out for real forms of autonomy, real protection for the rights of the people living there, um, that the Assad regime said no to, and that that's, you know, why these negotiations have not uh, gone anywhere. And it's, you know, again, this is something the leadership there is acutely aware of, uh, and it's precisely why they've been simultaneously seeking both American and Russian support uh, in trying to get as much leverage as possible uh, for their dealings with the regime. Uh, and the question precisely, I think, for Americans is how to uh, enable them to get to benefit from both those forms of support simultaneously in the most effective way possible. Uh, and certainly, you know, yes, I think thankfully we've moved beyond uh, any sense of America um, being an obstacle to the SDF engaging in Russian supported negotiations with the regime. That's certainly good. Um, you know, and I do think in part what the United States can do to help uh, you know, the SDF, which does have its own agency and is gonna figure out how to use the leverage it has in the most effective way possible. Uh, do that is to be honest internally and by, as a result, honest with them about what exact form of commitment we're willing to make. Uh, and again, exactly what I do worry about is there is this default sense that the US military presence there, the status quo can go on indefinitely um, and that just enough rhetoric, just enough thinking uh, supporting that view uh, when, in fact, that the real commitment to that policy is not there. You know, and again, if Washington is willing to commit to that policy, if it's willing to say, we will keep these forces here indefinitely and defend, you know, them against any kind of attacks, any kind of, um, you know, efforts to sabotage that presence, then yes, that's a, that's a policy. If we're not going to do that, we should think honestly and, again, communicate honestly with the SDF. Uh, about that. And looking at what happened in October 2019, I mean, the, so much of the horror there wasn't uh, the sense that the United States owed the uh, Syrian Kurds an indefinite military presence, but the extremely ill-planned, extremely sudden, extremely rash way that the, in the end, partial withdrawal was conducted, you know, that seemed like the real betrayal of our partners. Uh, finally, you know, the question of the Arab majority in northeastern Syria, uh, certainly something where, you know, the United States 
to a limited extent, tried to use its leverage such as it had it with the YPG in terms of pushing them to be uh, a more egalitarian actor, to live up to some of their rhetoric about being a multicultural force. Uh, I certainly understand why members there, majority there, uh, have concerns on this front. Uh, I also understand why many people uh, there think that given the realistic other options, preserving uh, SDF autonomy is probably the lesser evil. I think we have a few more minutes to take one or two questions further and then give each of you an opportunity to share your final thoughts with the audience. The next question, Mona, is to you from Alex. Uh, she says, you mentioned the US government failed to assess the stakes and or willingness for external actors to intervene. How can we better anticipate increasingly common regional interventions during both the analytical and the policy discussions? It's a great question. Um, and I, I think the analytical discussions is the first place to get at this. And it really is about rigorously checking our assumptions. It's also about allowing for creative thinking. Um, you know, my, my, one of my concerns about Syria uh, and frankly the think tank community is the ways in which really an echo chamber was developed over some years, and it's very difficult to inject different ways of thinking. It's very difficult to inject bad news um, assessments about where things are. I think often our policy making is captive to policy making in a world as we wish it would be, as opposed to what it is. And so, you know, I think a lot of red teaming on the analytic side, um, a lot of um, uh, encouragement of assumption checking and creative thinking is important and I think and I think also for for analysts to speak frankly to policymakers and for policymakers to be open to that to those um, you know that unwelcome news sometimes I, I, and I think frankly the one that we're confronted with now is an assessment that Assad's hold on power is is stable and that he's not going anywhere and it's an unpopular thing to say, but I think we ignore it, you know, at our peril. Better to, to raise the assessment honestly and then start thinking very clearly about, okay, with that conundrum, what, what are the next best steps going forward? I'll stop there. Thanks, Mona. I'm going to uh, frame this next question for all three of you, uh, if you, if you want to weigh in. This is from Alice. How can the United States balance not always doing something, in quotes, with demonstrating global initiative on issues like human rights? Nick, you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, in a way, initiative provides a sort of easy answer to that. In the extent the, the United States does take the initiative, chooses areas where it wants to take a leadership role, where it thinks there's an opportunity to take a leadership role uh, that can potentially be more productive than, you know, seeing every conflict as a responsibility to take that leadership role. Um, and it's, you know, inevitably it results in accusations of hypocrisy, but I don't, given you know, the scale of the challenges the United States faces around the world, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the United States deciding that there are moments, there are situations where it can make a difference uh, in applying its, its limited uh, diplomatic energy to making a difference in those situations. Um, there's also, you know, this is a point a number of other people have made, the conflation of doing something with doing something militarily. Uh, in it, you know, there's a lot to be said for recognizing opportunities where the United States can do something uh, that isn't militarily. Um, I also think it's incumbent on people, you know, I, people who are anti-interventionist, people who are pro-restraint, I do sometimes exaggerate the impact of many of these non-military uh, measures. And I don't think we should be naive or overly optimistic about them either. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, say we should be very wary about trying to do something militarily because it can often backfire catastrophically. We should also recognize that trying to do something non-militarily can have limited impact. Um, you know, and then to go back to what Mona was saying earlier, I mean, there's in terms of dealing with the humanitarian consequences of these catastrophes, there's always so much more the United States can do. Um, you know, whether to support countries that are taking in refugees uh, as a result of conflicts. I mean, heaven forbid we consider taking in more refugees ourselves. 
you know, these are steps that, you know, do amount to doing something. Uh, and that, you know, if they're not as dramatic as what uh, the kind of leadership we sometimes want to display I can in real concrete terms be more valuable. Uh, Robert, Mona, I want to give you a chance to, to add your thoughts to that particular question, but also give you each in turn an opportunity to share some final thoughts with our audience. Robert, if you'd like to go first. Um, the question about what to do about human rights is is an excellent question. Um, I think two, two key points. Number one, um, it's very hard for the United States to use uh, the military to impose human rights somewhere um, in an ex to an extent. Um, we tried that in Iraq and it didn't turn out perfectly well. Although I also will say having just visited Iraq, it's a lot better now than it used to be. Um, and I think in some ways Iraq in the end may turn out better than we thought, problematic as it is. Um, second, um, with respect to a place like Syria, where you're dealing with a government, which, as as Mona correctly noted, was willing to go to the mat, um, the use of force, is, it has a lot of problems. And so uh, just as we had to wait for a long time for the human rights situation in a place like Eastern Europe to improve, and we literally had to wait. 40 years almost, um, it, it, we may require longer term, uh, dare I say what my colleague Ryan Crocker always referred to as strategic patience. Not to say we abandon uh, the principle of defending human rights, but recognizing uh, that evolution could take decades. And I think in a place like Syria, that's definitely what we're talking about. Um, I want to then close with with one thought, uh, Mona very correctly said we need to question assumptions. I totally agree with that. Um, real failure on our parts when I was working on Syria uh, to do that. Um, I would also just say um, we need, it's hard to do that for two reasons. Number one, um, intelligence is not complete, is not perfect. I mean, in the Hollywood movies, the CIA always knows what's going on and they have, they can tell you exactly what's happening. Well, in the real world, away from Hollywood, um, information is very incomplete. And so on a question like uh, the longevity of Bashar al-Assad, I don't know that the intelligence community is going to be able to tell us a whole lot. They might, but my guess is they probably can't. And so um, recognize going in that as you question assumptions, your information pro and con is limited. Um, it just makes the whole exercise harder. And then there's a second part of challenging a Shamsun, which is if you say, well, the assumption maybe is wrong, you need to play it out a little bit, um, both first order, but second and ideally third order. Um, I have to say, President Obama actually did that quite a bit on Syria policy, which was one of the reasons there was a lot of hesitation, because the second and third order uh, questions, which, for example, George uh, w. Bush never looked at in Iraq, never. I mean, all the debates I was in about Iraq, I never saw second or third order um, repercussions discussed. Um, Obama, by contrast, did it all the time, and it made it look like a more halting policy, but I think most people would agree, in the end, as bad as Syria is, uh, Iraq was much worse for the United States. And so uh, question assumptions, but you know, play it out a little bit, second and third order as well. It's an excellent lesson. Um, we'd have we need an addendum to your paper, Nick. Mona, final final thoughts from you. Sure, I'll be very brief. Just let me pick up on Robert's last point. So I totally agree, Robert. And I think for me, questioning assumptions actually entails interrogating second and third order effects. And for me, the issue is more not that information is incomplete, which it always is, but actually I think there's a profusion of sources of information. And um, in a conflict as complex as the one in Syria, it's really incumbent on analysts to, to be able to parse through all of that. And, and that's no easy task. Um, on the question of human rights, I'll be very, very brief. I mean, I'm gonna give a, an inherently contradictory answer. First, I wanna um, underscore what Nick said, which is this notion of doing something always being interpreted as militarily. 
And often I think we see these questions do not, as Robert also said, do not lend themselves to military interventions. And I think it's incumbent on us as we are now getting well into the 21st century to really think hard and develop um, new tools uh, for, for peace building, for uh, inherent you know, uh, enforcement of human rights norms. We have to do much more in terms of working and, and, and nurturing alliances. This is not something the US can do by itself. But I also think one of the lessons learned from Syria and from these large scale military interventions that characterize the past 20 years post 9-11 is we have not figured out what the sweet spot is for the use of force. And we've not really figured out how to harness force in the service of diplomacy uh, rather than using force and then coming through and trying to clean up with diplomacy. And here, I think we didn't get into it. I do think the red line incident in Syria, uh, when Assad used chemical weapons on his own people, killing well over a thousand civilians, that was a watershed moment. And in my view, that was potentially a lost opportunity to explore the limited use of force uh, in response to a very egregious transgression of an international norm, but it would have had to have been married up with rigorous diplomacy with the Russians and others, uh, it you know counterfactuals are never, <laughs> never going to you know be helpful. I think in some ways, but could that have been a moment uh, to shift the trajectory of the conflict in Syria? We'll never know, but it's I think it's worth at least asking the question. Uh, which Nick tries to do in the paper, and I think we've we've tried to cover at least some of the ground on um, what should perhaps have happened uh, over the last eleven years. Nick, a final word to you, if you want it. No, I just add. I mean, I my background is as a historian. I this paper was not intended to rehash or relitigate all these debates, but I'm fully in favor of rehashing and relitigating debates. I actually think it's very important. I think playing out these counterfactuals is enormously important. Um, I don't have great answers to them. The paper does not seek to give great answers to them, but it includes a number of things, a number of uh, lessons that I think in playing out these counterfactuals uh, are helpful, will hopefully be helpful, uh, will enable people to think about some of the, the second or third order aspects of the counterfactuals we're playing out. And I, you know, I think that process should continue because it's how we learn from the past. That's an excellent note to end on. Nick, thank you for the excellent paper that formed the basis of our conversation today. Robert, Mona, thank you so much for joining us. And to all of you who watched and participated in the Q&A, thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to hosting you for another discussion soon. Take care.